momentum in this tournament, so I wouldn't be surprised to see him bring it. But um, he was able to use the combination of the Rotom Heat and the Togekiss just to really overwhelm his opponent in that finals. And I'm really excited to see him play it out here. Um, Yusuke, on the other hand, um, unfortunately, I'm not as familiar with uh, his team. I think we mm -hmm. did see this on stream the other day because I do remember him having a hit on top that was seemed like it would be pretty hype. But I don't think we saw it revealed. Uh, but I do know that Yusuke um, or Yuki has been uh, pretty close with a lot of the Japanese players here. So I wouldn't be surprised if these two are at least familiar with each other. They might know their teams already going into it. So um, I'm, I'm curious to see if we're going to see some deeper reads because of that earlier on in game one. I know a lot of times trainers will play game one kind of safe, you know, maybe make safer predictions, safer plays, but if these trainers are already familiar with each other and their play styles, we might see them go a couple levels deeper early on. So that's something to keep an eye out for. And this is day two of Swiss. It's so also day two of Swiss. Yeah, so there's a lot of information that you know these players are starting to gather from other matches that they played earlier on. You know, what are the texts that people are running, you know, from the matches that they played previously? Are there any sort of inklings or inclinations that you can gather about what your opponent might be running just based on prior experience that you have playing in the tournament yourself? Oh, definitely. Um, and one thing that you also have to keep in mind is that, you know, it's possible that these trainers actually saw, or at least Yuki saw uh, Yusuke on stream the other day. Uh, we did not feature any of Yuki's matches yesterday, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So he might have some prior knowledge from that as well. But, you know, just looking at the team compositions as we go into team preview, there's really only one Pokemon that's different on both sides <laughs> of the field. And that's something really interesting to talk about. It is. It's going to be one of the more supportive Pokemon for each of the teams. It's going to be a hit on top there for Yusuke, and it's going to be that Indeedy there for Yuki. So very interesting decision to swap up those supportive Pokemon. Usually you see those swaps for some sort of niche situation that you're looking at trying to make sure that you don't fall into a trap of. Yeah, and in the past, Hitmontop has been used for its Intimidate ability and access to Fake Out alongside of Fighting-type attacks, whereas Ndidi does get access to Psychic Terrain, and we saw the female form of Ndidi during Team Preview, so that means it might be running something like a Follow Me, but we'll have to see that revealed later on in the game because it's not on the field quite yet. Yeah, the gender of the Ndidi does matter because the Follow Me is the only one that the female Ndidi can learn, so it is going to be a bit of a tell I would say if you do see that Ndidi there uh, but right now that's not exactly what we're seeing on the field. <laughs> not at all. We're going to see a Togekiss and an Excadrill coming out from Yuki and Yusuke is going to be matching that Togekiss and also bringing that Rotom Heat. So I like this board position for both these trainers really. Having the Togekiss out against each other I think uh, gives them a lot of momentum but I also like how Yuki did decide to uh, withdraw the Excadrill for the Gastrodon. You know that Excadrill was, uh, could be threatened by an overheat from that Rotom Heat on Yusuke's side of the field. So overall, just a really good adjustment. And even better knowing that Yusuke also went for a switch of his own to get that Intimidate out on the field. That Intimidate would have been more impactful if you had still had the Excadrill there, but I think that this switch from Yuki actually prevents quite a bit of that Intimidate pressure coming out from Yusuke. So Gastrodon now in the field, and also a Protect from this Togekiss is going to make this a fairly mute turn for both of these players, but really what's most important is getting that positioning. Getting that positioning, and it, Yusuke does have a bit of an advantage now, knowing that uh, Hitmontop is out on the field, even though it didn't get used get to use its Intimidate against that Excadrill, it does potentially have access to a Fake Out here, and something like a Fake Out plus a Thunderbolt onto that Togekiss would do a significant amount of chip damage to it. And when you look at how Yuki's team is sort of set up, knowing that he brought both the Excadrill and the Gastrodon, it's possible that the Togekiss is going to be something he looks to to try and absorb a lot of damage with those Follow Me. So the more damage you get down onto it, the less uh, damage it has to sort of mitigate throughout the rest of the game. Well, there's that follow me coming out from Yuki's Togekiss and the Thunderbolt as well, which means that Togekiss is going to have to soak up that damage, oh, but it's a one-hit knockout. That was crazy powerful. That might be an indication that that Rotom is holding something like a Choice Specs, given the fact we did not see any um, Life Orb damage taken there. Well, of course, you have to be really careful here. Um, you know, it's obviously not confirmed yet, but seeing a Togekiss get KO'd so easily is huge. But usually also when you see Togekiss just being able to survive multiple turns, you ha usually has some sort of super effective berry to soak up that damage. Yeah. So otherwise, Togekiss can be somewhat frail, depending on how it's trained. Yeah, it does depend a lot on how it's trained, and that's something we should keep in mind for, you know, 
when we see that Togekiss come back probably in a future game, another interesting reveal from Yuki is the fact that he has the yawn on the Gastrodon. You know, that's a move that you normally see on Togekiss, actually. So uh, having that uh, access to yawn means that he can at least try and force a couple switches here. But looking at the board state and looking at the fact that the Rotom did just switch, you have to think if it was locked into choice specs, you know, Thunderbolt, would have been its move of choice and you have two ground type pokemon on the field so even though it's great that the intimidate is coming out as well for that extra drill i think that was more of a confirmation that it was something like the choice specs items just given every uh, all the other pieces of information we have on the board right now switching out the rotom is going to ensure that you can choose a different move later but what's also going to happen here is that to hip on top going to be able to come in and get that intimidate off onto this dynamax extra drill Excadrill now has the ability to go for a move. It's going to be that max steel spike right into that Hitman top slot. It's going to be about half damage, which is a good chunk. You have to wonder how much it would have done without the Intimidate. You really wonder that. I feel like it would have been that much more. But oh, look at this. The Hitman top is going to reveal that it has the eject button and will switch out. And this is a great opportunity again for Yusuke to adjust. I don't think the Rotom will be making an appearance again, knowing that the Excadrill just Dynamax, but this would be a good opportunity to get Togekiss back out on the field. You know, we know that this Excadrill has been intimidated and those max steel spikes won't be as powerful. So if this Gastrodon is looking to try and find a KO on that Excadrill on Yuki's side of the field with something like an Earth Power, um, Togekiss alongside of it will definitely help protect it long enough to probably find it. Togekiss coming back on the field, just like you mentioned, Gabby. Um, but it will be an Earth Power from the Gastrodon hitting into the Dynamax to Excadrill, which is going okay. to activate a weakness policy. Weakness policy, Excadrill, not usually something that you see too often, but that's going to be the last attack that this Gastrodon gets off for a while. And with that weakness policy, this uh, Excadrill will be at neutral attack, assuming we see that Hitmontop switch back in. So that is a great sort of tech there for Yuki to try and stop, you know, uh, Yusuke's strategy of just slowly switching the Hitmontop in and out and in and out. Um, that's one of the things that Hitmontop actually excels at. You know, it is a bulkier fighting type Pokemon. And in the past, you've seen it used heavily with Pokemon like Togekiss or Gastrodon, who have great defensive synergy with it. Mm -hmm. So if you can predict what type of attack your opponent's going to target it with, you can safely switch it out, switch it back in, and then get some more Intimidates down. And the Eject button only helps speed up that process. The Eject button already used, though. So we will see the Hitmontop come back out, but won't be able to escape so freely anymore. Yeah, and this Max Quake is going to be really big for Yuki as well. Uh, I like how he predicted that the Togekiss wouldn't stay in and go for another Steel Spike, mm -hmm. just because this Max Quake will boost its own, uh, that Excadrill's own special defense. And not that the Gastrodon is going to wake up this turn anyways, uh, because of the Yawn, we know this is the first turn of sleep. Uh, also, revealing the key barrier, so that's pretty interesting. But, you know, when this Gastrodon does eventually wake up from the yawn, it will be unable to do as much damage as it would before. So I, I do like the fact that Yuki is just consistently going for yawns onto Yusuke's team. I think that it's not as uh, detrimental against uh, Yusuke's stra overall strategy as it may be against some other trainers. You know, I think Yusuke doesn't mind switching a lot. I think he's mm -hmm. very comfortable with it, given how he's been approaching this game so far. But just to confirm that if he decides to not switch, uh, he, his Pokemon will be going to sleep. I think that it's uh, it, it's good to just, you know, keep that pressure on him to keep him cycling in and out. Because when you do run strategies like this, where you have to switch turn after turn after turn, or you want to switch, um, which is kind of both the case in this uh, battle, you slowly take damage, you slowly rack up, you know, those uh, those uh, damage onto your Pokemon, and as a result, uh, your opponent is just in a better spot to go for those big KO moves. We're gonna see a double switch. Rodom coming back in, and Tyranitar now coming in for Yuki's Gastrodon. It's going to set the sand, and Gastrodon for Yusuke going to wake up and go for a Protect. Doesn't want to take too much damage here, just in case this extra roll oh. decides to target it down. But a max rock fall oh. is going to go right into the Rodom slot, and that's going to be a barely capable of getting the knockout. And that was a really good prediction there by Yuki, because it was either going to be the Rotom or the Togekiss that would switch in for that Hitmontop. So going for a max rock fall ensured super effective damage on both.
It is going to be super effective damage for sure, but that Rotom Heat going to hold on with barely a sliver of health. It will be able to get off at least one more attack before either Yusuke decides to switch it out or the sand knocks it out or some type of weather gets reset. But the Rotom will switch out here and in its stead will be that hit on top. Just again, getting the Intimidates off. The Intimidates seem to be so impactful for making sure that that Rotom Heat survived. Yeah, you have to wonder if Yuki's going to switch out his own Excadrill after a couple of turns, just because these Intimidates really have added up on it. You know, he no longer has the benefit of that weakness policy offsetting those attack drops. And I mean, that Rock Slide just did nothing. Rockslide not doing very much in this recover, going to do even more here for Yusuke's Gastrodon. We'll be able to get his HP restored almost to full, and him on top being the only one that's going to take the Sandstorm damage. Yeah, there's a lot of ground type on the field right now. There's a lot of ground type on the field. <laughs> yeah, you don't normally see that, I feel like, at least before this weekend. Um, but I I really like how this the pace of this game is going. It's very slow on both these uh, both sides of the field and you know that they're both waiting for the moment to sort of s to go on the offensive i think in yuki's case here you have to switch out that excadrill i don't think you want it to stay in at this point the rock slide flinch uh is not going to benefit you too much you know the hitmon top could threaten to fake out that excadrill and then gastrodon could easily double into it with a knockout um Though it looks like it's going to be a different switch this time. Yusuke sending in the Togekiss, not wanting to preserve the Intimidate. Doesn't want to preserve the Intimidate, but rather going for the Fake Out. Looks All like right. Yusuke is really prioritizing the Fake Out pressure onto the Gastrodon, but it means that the Togekiss is going to have to take this Rock Slide in. But would you look at this? Togekiss actually getting moved into the Rock Slide is going to proc its weakness policy. And, you know, we mentioned how weakness policy is such an important item, but you, you kind of never know where it's going to be on the team. Yeah, and weakness policy Togekiss is certainly a great pick given this matchup overall. You know, the uh, Excadrill has been intimidated to the point where those Iron Heads or whatever steel type attack it has, plus those Rock Slides, are just not going to be doing any damage to this Togekiss. And it will be able to do some big damage, assuming it is the Pokemon that wants to Dynamax on Yuki's side of the field. We haven't seen him gone for that, go for that mechanic yet, and it's possible that he's just been buying time here, trying to you know, maybe lure Yuki into a false sense of security with all of his switching, so that he can switch in Togekiss on an easy attack, get weakness policy up, and then start to just demolish the Pokemon on Yuki's side of the field. Yusuke used expert maneuvering in order to set up this Togekiss to be able to Dynamax with the weakness policy buff that it just got moments before from the Excadrill's Rock Slide. And the Iron Head, instead of targeting down the Togekiss where it would have been super effective damage, decides to go for the Gastrodon. Max Airstream firing back from the Togekiss wow. is going to do so much damage into the Gastrodon just because of the weakness policy boost. Yeah, just because of that weakness policy boost. It's why Togekiss is so good in this format. Um, you know, it is able to run weakness policy alongside of a lot of other Pokemon now that di the Dynamax factor is a thing. And if you are in a situation where it is unchecked, which unfortunately for Yuki is the situation he's found himself in, even though this Togekiss lacks the ability to deal super effective damage against this Excadrill, it's been intimidated to the point where it would need a critical hit or two or three in order to sort of power through it. And in the... Uh, in the Tyranitar's case, it's most likely that this Togekiss carries something like a Dazzling Gleam, since that's the, the common moves that you see with weakness policy. And that would be an easy knockout there. So, again, Yusuke just playing the uh, revolving door of Pokemon strategy very, very well in this match. You know, knowing when to switch in that Togekiss, when to activate the weakness policy, and now when to clean up. Gonna get a, quite a bit of cleanup here. I think the Hitmon top being able to rotate in and out yes. was so pivotal in order to ensure that there are going to be Pokemon that survive through those extra drills attacks. Yuki had to ha make some decisions that I think will need to be an adjustment moving into games two and potentially a game three if Yuki can come back from this game one where that extra girl needs to be preserved just a little bit better and protected from all of those intimidate switches. Yeah, and what I find really interesting was that Yuki locked in his forfeit right there. You know, I think it was pretty clear to us and most likely him that he wasn't in a favorable position in that match, but you have to wonder if there was something on that Tyranitar that he didn't want to reveal in this game one that he might be relying 
playing on four game two. When you look at how Yusuke was playing and how he was rotating out the Hitmontop, the Togekiss, and the Rotom, you know, two of those Pokemon share weaknesses to Tyranitar's most uh, popular attack, which is the Rock Slide. So it's possible that one of the adjustments he's considering going into this game is to have that T-Tar and that Excadrill, you know, again, on his party, but maybe stagger them somehow or otherwise try to switch in the T-Tar and the Excadrill so that he can apply that pressure, uh, you know, sort of like what Yusuke was doing. It's really hard to play these strategies where your opponent is just constantly switching in and out like that because you do need to find an opening. and. Unfortunately for Yuki, because the Hitmontop was really the crux of Yusuke's strategy with that Intimidate, mm -hmm. um, and the fact that he didn't really bring any special attackers with him, I, Gastrodon does attack with special damage, but it wasn't in a situation where I would have expected it to do damage, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, he was just locked into those Intimidates after a certain point, and it just added up too fast. Looking at his team, he does have a couple other adjustments he could consider making. I gotta shout out the Ndidi just because it is a psychic type Pokemon, and if you want to get rid of him on top quickly, you will really want to be hitting it for that super effective damage. But I think Togekiss would be the better Pokemon to pick for that. But looking at how Yuki played Togekiss in that game one, I, I don't think he wants to play it offensively. I think he wants to use it as a supportive Pokemon with using that yawn to try and put Yusuke's Pokemon to sleep, but. Fortunately for Yusuke, you know, he knows how to buy time. He knows how to wait those turns for his Pokemon to wake up. So I don't think that's quite the strategy he would go for. I was going to say, I feel as though Yuki using the Yawn from the Togekiss and as well as a potential Yawn from the Gastrodon as well to really help really helped Yusuke cycle through their Pokemon and actually yeah. kind of played a bit more into the strategy than what I would have liked to see. Yeah, it, it wasn't a punishing strategy when Yuki was using those yawns. It was, um, I would say, a parallel strategy, which is a very weird way to describe it, but it went alongside of Yusuke's thinking, which ultimately worked out better for him. When you use yawn aggressively like Yuki was trying to do, it's normally because your opponent doesn't have a way they can easily cycle in and out, so you're forcing them to make really tough decisions. But in Yusuke's case, those were decisions he was comfortable making. Well, here's the decision. Switching things up just a little bit. It's going to still be the two Togekiss on the field for both Yuki and Yusuke. But for Yuki, it'll be the Rotom Heat. And Yusuke's bringing out the Hitmontop earlier on in this game. I like the fact that the Rotom Heat is making an appearance. Uh, if Yuki is able to find a quick KO onto that Togekiss, that'll certainly help remove one of the pivots that Yusuke has on his team to switch around. We know already that this Hitmontop has a Ject Button on it as well. So looking at the... Uh, fact that Yuki does not have any physical attackers on his team uh, present on the field yet. This might be an opportunity for him to try and hit it with some damage just to force it out. So that's one less switch that Yusuke has access to later on. Dynamax really early here. We saw those Dynamaxes preserved a little bit towards the middle of the game, but this time it's going to be a very early Dynamax coming out from Yusuke and a follow me from Yuki. So whatever attack decides to come out from either this Hitmontop or this Togekiss from Yusuke's side is going to end up going right into the Togekiss. But look at this. It's going to be a bullet punch first. No fake out. Yusuke predicted the follow me or at least wanted to target the Togekiss regardless going for that bullet punch. That was pretty smart. That was incredibly intelligent. He ended up getting some chip damage, but I think for the Max Airstream, the biggest proponent of that is actually going to be the speed boost that both of these Pokemon are getting. Not necessarily something that they need though because Rotom going for this nasty plot. I, I like the nasty plot here from Rotom. I think that was a very safe play for Yuki. Um, if Yusuke went for the fake out onto that Rotom, he would have been able to stop it. But Togekiss still has enough health left so that Follow Me should protect it from another bullet punch and a attack from that Togekiss. I mean, it's going to be close because Togekiss did consume the battery berry uh, to weaken that bullet punch, but, you know, I, I think it's a pretty safe play for Yuki to go, maybe even Dynamax that Rotom. You know, he got the plus two special attack boost yes. thanks to that nasty plot. That might be all he needs to try and pick up an advantage, especially knowing that the Togekiss is stuck on the field for Yusuke at this moment. We've seen it before, though, players opting to take out their Dynamax Pokemon in case of saving them for a different strategy here. But 
with that nasty plot boost, it's about time that Yuki also utilizes their own Dynamax energy and that Rotom Heat's going to get a little bit of an extra buff here as it increases in size and gets d double health pool. Max Guard from Yusuke's Togekiss in its Dynamax form is going to keep it very safe from any attacks coming out. And as we predicted, it will be another follow me just in case we do see some additional damage coming in. But that Max Lightning not going to be able to get any sort of damage off because of that Max Guard. Yeah, and that's exactly why you leave the Togekiss on the field. I agree with you that there are situations where you would want to switch out your Dynamax Pokemon. But in this case, whatever this Pokemon... This isn't one of them. This isn't one of them because whatever Pokemon is going to come into that slot would have been taking huge huge damage from Max Lightning, unless it was Gastrodon. So if we see the Togekiss switch here, which is exactly what just happened, um, I wouldn't be surprised if Gastrodon is not far behind. Gastrodon coming for Togekiss's stead. Another Togekiss on the field. Yuki's will be going for the follow me. And now it's time for some of these Rotoms to do some work here. Volt Switch getting revealed, and that will be enough to get the knockout onto the Togekiss. So not only does this Rotom get to do super effective damage, but this is excellent repositioning now from Yusuke. And Volt Switch is another move that confirms, you know, that Choice Specs item onto that Rotom, because normally you don't have room to run Volt Switch unless you're running a Choice item. Just ends up hitting so quickly, so you get a chance to switch out right before exactly. you even needs to be a problem. And it plays well into Yusuke's overall strategy of just switching everywhere. You know, Yusuke has embraced the revolving door of Pokemon. He's <laughs> become it. And I really love seeing that play out because I, this is a very defensive play style that I don't think we've seen highlighted yet in the VGC 2020 format. And uh, it's really all cool to see how Yuki, you know, both these teams are, sh they share a lot of Pokemon. Again, the big differences are the Hitmontop and the Ndidi, mm -hmm. but you could just tell by the playstyle of Yusuke versus the playstyle of Yuki that having that Hitmontop just makes such a huge difference on how you play this matchup, on how you time your switches. Um, I'm curious to see how this will play out now, knowing that the Rotom is on its last turn of Dynamax, but I think more importantly, knowing that the Gastrodon is on the field and will not be able to surprise Yuki with any switch-ins at this point. So Rotom should have an opportunity here to go for one big Dynamax attack. And I think that if Yuki wants to catch up in this game and maybe bring us into a game three during this uh, tournament, he needs to find that opening right now. Needs to find the maximum value coming out from oh. this last one. But an ally switch <laughs> might mess up some plans here. Togekiss revealing that it's going oh to have no. that supportive move. But that ally switch means that this extra drill for Yuki is going to be able to get the sword stance off for potentially free, depending on what this Gastrodon decides to do. But a max flare from the there Rodon will be going into the Gastrodon. And oh, okay. uh, <laughs> still does quite a chunk of damage. Yeah, but... You know, Yuki didn't go for the max lightning, and even though I don't think the Gastrodon was the intended target of that max flare, got the sunlight up to protect the Excadrill from that Scald, and more importantly, it did damage. So, I, we're in a completely different situation now. The weakness policy activated, the sword stance activated. We know that Yuki's Pokemon are currently faster because there is no max airstream or tailwind on the field. So Yuki has an amazing opportunity right now to go on the offensive, and that's exactly what you need to do against uh, teams that enjoy switching like this, because even if the Hitmontop makes an appearance, it's going to be taking a very powerful Thunderbolt, most likely, from that Rotom, or maybe even an Overheat, uh, depending on who he wants to target. This Excadrill is free to go for something like a Rock Slide, an Iron Head. Really doesn't matter, just attack, 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 and... Again, you punish your opponent for switching. This is the board uh, state that I think Yuki was really searching for in game one, but he just could not find it. This is such, that was such a heads up play by Yuki. It just really going was, for the max yeah. flare instead of going for the max lightning. I think that was incredibly intelligent. And now Yusuke's in a bit of a pinch. You're gonna be exchanging that Togekiss for the Rotom Heat, just in case we are going to see the earthquake come out. And I think that was also a very heads up play both Rotom's not going to be affected by this, but that Earthquake going to be enough damage to get the knockout onto the Gastrodon. And even though it wasn't going to be the Dynamax Rotom that gets the damage, Whoa. but... That was just a discharge a from that Rotom on Yuki's side of the field. Yes, oh, it was. Oh, that's clever. 
Oh, okay. So this is actually a really cool throwback to one of the first strategies that I ever ran in a VGC tournament. Uh, you run a ground type Pokemon with Earthquake, and then you run a floating and or flying type Pokemon with Discharge, because they can't hurt each other, but they can deal massive amounts of damage mm -hmm. to any Pokemon on the opposing side of the field. So it's Regardless of what Pokemon gets uh, faked out or flinched here by this Hitmontop at this point in time, you know, it's still going to be doing a ton of damage. It's possible that the Rotom on Yusuke's side of the field would be KO'd by another Discharge. It's going to be super close. That is going to so end up cool. being a roll. That was an <laughs> excellent strategy for Yuki. Yuki has had multiple intelligent turns in a row to really bring them into the end game. And also getting the knockout out of the Gastrodon means that we have a bit more of an even playing field between these two trainers, Yusuke and Yuki. Now, Yuki is kind of looking at what to do next. And I feel as though, even though that we got the Intimidate from that Hitmontop off what is that really doing against a Excadrill that has the Swords Dance as well as the Weakness Policy? I mean, I'm curious to know more about this Excadrill's moveset because it's very possible here that if Yuki doesn't run Protect, you might do something like we just saw play out. Um, but I like how Yusuke just went for the flinch into the Rotom regardless. I think that's a very safe play. And really, the Rotom, I think, is wow. the Pokemon that... Uh, Yusuke had to be afraid of, but what a tough call for Yuki there, you know, having to make that switch. He just gave up a plus three attack Excadrill, um, and he does have the benefit of it coming in on the field when there is no fake out threatening it, but I would have imagined he would have much rather utilized that plus three attack uh, during that turn. Um, it's it's interesting because you have to wonder now we, we've seen the earthquake we know that it has a rock type attack from game one mm -hmm. we know that it has an iron head uh because we saw it uh, the steel spike and then we know it has sword stance so th this is a very difficult pokemon to run because without protect you know even when you are in situations like we just saw where you do have the attack advantage you do have the speed advantage uh, sort of um you have to Identify your win condition, which is you don't let the Excadrill get knocked out. Mm -hmm. And then you have to make a very tough call like that switch. So I think that Yuki still has a decent amount of momentum behind him. But mm. this wide guard might just change that entirely. I was going to oh. say, I got really excited because the wide guard is actually going to end up eating this rock slide, protecting both of the Pokemon on Yusuke's field. And oh. this overheat now, this extra That's drill, rough. unfortunately not going to be able to get too much done in this game, even though it had that plus three attack. That is a really, really tough play right there. Him on top has been known to carry wide guard for a very long time. And in a situation like that, Again, you can't use Earthquake to knock out the Rotom because uh, we don't have Mold Breaker on that Excadrill, so there's no way for that to connect. Um, Iron Head probably wouldn't have done a lot of damage, so you really have to go for the Rock Slide. So, you know, I think that it was a really good call for Yusuke to keep that hidden until the end of this game. Uh, Gastrodon certainly could try and power through these three Pokemon with enough yawns and enough sleep on the field, but it's going to be a very very difficult ask as that critical hit almost seals the deal for Yusuke's win here. I think Yuki did a great job of trying to find a win condition and trying to identify how to play through this game when their play styles are just so, so different. And Yusuke was so comfortable making those switches in game one. But unfortunately for Yuki, I think Yusuke just had the upper hand the entire time. If he had, if Yuki had a protect on that Excadrill, I think we'd be talking about a much different game. That was such a tough call for him to make that turn. I think that was really tough because most of the time you see the Excadrill have some type of, you have essentially three different